why you um, love GBA, have been conducting research on the GBA and speak so highly about it. Can you share with us why? Yes. Uh, you see, I started working in China for the World Bank in uh, 1982. And uh, that was on a project, you know, a, a, a sewer project for Shanghai. But after in probably 83, I was asked to visit Shenzhen, which at the time was still a relatively small city. And I was asked to, I was asked to, uh, to explore the possibility of, uh, for the bank to finance infrastructure. And the people of Shenzhen told me that they were you know, at the time they had about 350,000 people and they were planning a city of 5 million uh, within 10 years, if I remember well. And I, I looked, you know, I made a calculation from the back of an envelope and I thought that it was far too ambitious that, uh, you know, the risk of uh, investing in infrastructure for a city which will develop so fast. There was no, I, I tried to find uh, a precedent and I couldn't find any precedent of a city growing so fast. So I told them, no, I mean, we, we will probably finance for a city of two million or maybe two and a half million, but that's already stretching it. So you see, that's, that's one skeleton I have in my closet. <laughs> and after that, of course, I followed what happened. Uh, it, it happened also that Hong Kong is one of my favorite cities. So I, 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 will, uh, I will stop by Hong Kong whenever I could. And uh, so I visited the area several times and I was absolutely amazed uh, by what was happening. And uh, especially by, you know, the, the, I think that a lot of the development of, uh, uh, of the Bay was, uh, was spontaneous. That means that it was really created by entrepreneur and the competition between the different uh, cities and counties there was a competition between them and they were very, uh, let's say, hospitable to new, uh, new ideas and a new type of zoning or, or land use. And I think that this spontaneous aspect is important to, to develop. You know, uh, at the time, most planners in China and in the rest of the world were, uh, were considering that the city is a uh, you know, is a monocentric thing with the center. And that's why in China, for instance, the classical plan was to extend the cities through the ring roads. And the fact that uh, the bay developed into a cluster, I think, was uh, was in, in a way a spontaneous thing. You know, that, uh, so that's, that's uh, it's a very long answer, but that's, uh, that's my answer to me. So here we are. Uh, let me see if, uh, yes, it's not true. So, uh, I will, uh, you know, this is just a short introductory, uh, introductory uh, talk, and I will divide my talk into three points. First, uh, cities are labor market, and if you consider the Bay Area, it's a it's a large urban cluster, and it has a, an enormous potential productivity. Then I will look at the, the Greater Bay Area uh, now and. Uh, I have to admit that uh, looking around the world, this is by far the largest urban labor market in the world, even as it is now. And uh, finally, I will, uh, I will discuss what still uh, need to be done. And, you know, the, this very large labor market is potential. It will really be achieved if you manage uh, transport mobility first within this enormous area. Uh, and, uh, and of course, the other area of, you know, like pollution and housing, I think also housing affordability is a big issue. So that's uh, the three main point of my talk. Uh, so cities as labor market, this is something that sometimes, you know, is surprising to some of my colleagues. Uh, obviously, a city is much more than a labor market, you know, we we move to cities, we, we meet our friends, we go to restaurant, we go to concert, we, we jog or do a lot of other things which are not linked to the labor market. But what I want to say here is that a city, the, the, 
the foundation of Esitates is labor market. The way the labor market, the day the labor market collapse, like we have seen in, in some cities like Detroit, for instance, everything that we like about cities uh, disappear at the same time. You know, the, the concert, the, the restaurant, all these things disappear. So it's absolutely essential, I think, for the administrators of a city, for the planners, for the mayors, to understand that the first thing is to be sure that this labor market are working. Uh, then, by the way, the economists have confirmed that the larger labor markets are, uh, the, the more productive and innovative is a city. It means that, you know, city allow people to meet randomly sometime, and that's where more productivity and uh, happen. It's also allow people in a large city with a large labor market, every individual is different, have different qualities, and that allow them to select uh, the best job for them. And during their life, the best job, which, you know, what is the best job when they are 25, might not be the best job when they are 40. And, and a very large city allow that. For the employer, it's the same thing. Uh, a, a, a very large labor market allows them to select the, the, the people really need for their enterprise and to keep uh, changing maybe their employees to reflect the, their new business. You know, when their business evolves, they need maybe a new type of labor. So this is why, uh, it, and it seems a bit paradoxical that, uh, you know, it's, it's very difficult to, you know, to, very complex to run a very large city of several millions of people. And you have more congestion, you have problem of, uh, you know, a lot of problem, uh, you know, uh, in the traffic and uh, health sometime. Uh, in spite of that, this very large labor market are always more productive than the smaller one. So, when we get, let, let's look at how, how this thing work. Uh, here I have a graph showing four type of, uh, uh, let's say, arrangement in the, in the way uh, the labor market works. So in the first one, on the, uh, completely on the left, uh, it's a classical monocentric model uh, where most of the jobs and amenities are concentrated in a CBD and uh, and most people commute from the suburbs to the CBD, and there are also usually high, de high residential densities around the CBD. Uh, this model doesn't exist really in very large cities. Uh, you will find it in city usually below one million people. It doesn't really uh, really exist, although it has been very useful as for economists, you know, the, the standard model. Then you have the dispersed model. Dispersed model is, you know, found mostly in, in North America. Uh, you know, cities like Los Angeles or Atlanta are, are shaped like that, or, or Houston or, or Dallas. Uh, basically, you have a very weak center, you know, which contain very, very few jobs. You know, if you look at Los, Los Angeles CBD, it has something like, I think, if I remember well, 8% of the job, you know, it's not really. And the jobs are really dispersed practically randomly uh, along the, the urban area. So it means that the trips there are, uh, are di have dispersed origin, but dispersed destination, which means that it's nearly impossible to have a, a large uh, transit system, you know, subway or, or even buses which function. The individual means of transport is practically the only way to get around. Um, and then you have the third model uh, in the middle is, uh, is the most common, in fact, it's you have a core uh, CBD, usually an historical one, with a lot of amenities, not only jobs, but amenities, you know, restaurant, museum, a concert hall, and things like that. And so you have a, a, a number of people who are commuting from the suburbs to this CBD, but then you have increasingly more and more commuting, which are from, uh, from suburbs to suburbs. In, this, in this, uh, the metropolitan area of New York, 70% of the trips are from suburbs to suburbs. They are not from suburbs to, to Manhattan, for instance. They are from suburbs to suburbs. The same for Paris, by the way. 
So, and then the, the, the FOSS model is in fact the urban cluster. This is the form of cities that we found in the, uh, you know, in, in the, the greater Bay Area. Uh, these are really uh, several CBD, but strong CBD with high density, high, but also suburbs in between. And this is rather unique. I will say this is unique to Asia. Uh, I have not found uh, this type of cluster in, in other countries so far. They may be emerging, but I have not seen them yet. Uh, for instance, say Delhi as a, as a, is a cluster now like that. Uh, and of course in China, you know, the Chinese government has identified a number of clusters. They, they are really, I think the one were functioning are about five. The other are kind of more in the, in the planning stage. So this uh, create a, a completely different, much more complex uh, transport system, you know, in order to, to deal with this, this thing. Uh, it requires also uh, a, an understanding, you know, uh, let's monitoring very carefully what is happening, where the, the jobs are emerging, what type of jobs are emerging, and, and uh, the type of transport which is required there uh, will be very different. You know, you cannot, if you have a cluster like that, like uh, the Greater Bay Area, where you have uh, 80 million people, you cannot just blow up uh, the subway system that you find in Shanghai or in Beijing and say, well, uh, we just uh, add more lines. It will not work. You have to have a, a specific uh, transport system to cater to this, uh, you know, very different animal. So the, what is specific to the Greater Bay Area is that it is the largest urban labor market in the world. I, I had here potentially because I believe that now the transport system do not allow anybody in the Bay to, to commute anywhere in the Bay. You know, they, the, the labor market in, in the Greater Bay Area is still fragmented probably around two or three cities. But it has a potential, I think, to become, uh, you know, much larger, you know, effectively much larger than it is. And I think the only limit to its size is really the, the transport technology and also uh, housing affordability. If it is possible for new workers to find an accommodation within this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, the greater Bay Area. So I, I will just uh, uh, illustrate that with a quotation from uh, my, my colleague and former boss, Paul Romer, with a Nobel Prize of Economics in 2018. Uh, this is extracted from his, his blog. Uh, he writes, if we treated Shenzhen as a city state, Analogous to Singapore or Hong Kong or Shenzhen has the fastest rate of GDP growth ever observed, ever observed. Over the 30 years from 1980 to 2010, output in Shenzhen increased thousandfold, which implies an average compound rate of growth that exceeds 20% per year. Now, uh, this observation why is Shenzhen so, the growth is so extraordinary? I think that part of it is explained by this enormous labor market, in, including, by the way, uh, using people from Hong Kong or, or Guangzhou. And, uh, you know, so if, if Shenzhen has been isolated somewhere, uh, it will not have had the, this growth. Even, uh, I'm well aware, of course, of all the reform which were tried in Shenzhen, which explain why the, uh, you know the, the growth? I you know I don't want to credit only the the geographical configuration for the growth of Shenzhen. There is of course many other things, but I think that uh, the the potential there was was important. So uh, here here is uh, the the population of the GBA is already larger than Germany. You know. Uh, so that's that's absolutely on on a relatively small area of uh, 20, about twenty five thousand uh, 
square kilometer. So here it is here, 25, 86 million people apparently now uh, with, this is it. If I compare the, the, the GBA to here on my graph below is Seoul with 25 million uh, people and Paris 12 million, you know, the three maps here are represented at the same scale. So you see that uh, w w they are completely dwarfing you know, the, the, the Greater Bay Area dwarf those two cities completely. Um, and you say also that their configuration, you know, both Seoul and and uh, Paris are still, uh, you know, what I call the, the compound city where large suburbs, but a very, very strong CBD, where, where the, the GBA has many CBD, which are really uh, important. So in, in Europe, we had also, uh, you know, some uh, cluster cities, but the Randstad, you know, in, in Holland was considered to be a, a cluster city, but it's only 8.5 million, you know, so we are, we have an order of magnitude above it. So we, we are again a, a different. If I compare to San Francisco Bay, uh, you know, the total population of San Francisco Bay, let's say around 10 million, a little below 10 million. So again, here, it's nearly also an order of magnitude uh, below the, the GBA. So one thing which, uh, you know, the, the, the economic dynamism of the GBA, uh, one indicator will be, among many, would be the number of building of uh, more than 300 meters. Uh, and the GBA has more than any other part of the big city in the world. Uh, and what is interesting too is that those skyscrapers are not in one CBD, but they are really in in one, in at least three. You know, Hong Kong, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen, and and some other cities. So this is again uh, what is very specific about about the Bay. Uh, now the transport innovation are still needed to fully integrate the potentially very large labor market. Uh, here is a. Uh, is a graph that I have extracted from a, a very interesting report on the Bay uh, by Gary Smith from Bearings. At the time he was working for Bearings, he's not. So it shows here, I, I'll show it more in detail. Uh, this was a transport, let's say, performance in 2010 uh, from, the, from Hong Kong. In one hour, you could just reach Shenzhen, but you know, it, it will take two hours to reach Dongguan or Guangzhou and, and three hours to the, the area around Guangzhou. And if you look at it now, it, well, 2018, I don't have the data for 2022, so it's already four years old. Uh, here we have, a, a, you, we see then the integration of a larger part of the labor market, although, uh, you know, some parts, for instance, in this case, uh, Jiaoqing or, or Jiangmen are, are a bit outside the, the uh, you know, the labor market. I mean, if you consider it for people living in Hong Kong. Uh, so to integrate this labor market, uh, you need to invent new means of urban transport. You know, just expanding existing metro line and feeder bus, you know, the way we do it in, in large cities will not do. You need, you need something different. And I think that it will require integrating light individual mode of transport with heavy rail on, in the same trip. When I say heavy rail, it, it might be any, you know, subway or it can be, uh, you know, any, any thing. So this is uh, the current uh, transport, you know, the rail transport system, transit system in the Bay, uh, simplified, of course. Uh, this is good, but you will need something else superimpose over it in order to be able to reach several area, you know, what people call the last mile, I will call it the last five miles. You will need from all those stations to reach the, you know, to integrate really the labor market. So you see, don't forget that, you know, the subway in general are getting very quickly heavily congested. You know, this is a, a, Beijing, a picture of Beijing subway. Beijing subway is one of the best design in the world. It's very recent, it's extremely modern. But in spite of that, you see, this is the congestion in uh, at rush hour in Beijing subway. Uh, this is, so we have to, uh, you know, in the Bay, you will have to 
to transport much more people, you know, in, in a faster. So you will have to invent new system. And the new system to me are probably to, to complement the heavy rail with a light means of transport, which, you know, you can pick up at the station to go to your final destination. So in a way, you have a, you have a transport which pick you up at your door, bring you to the station. When you arrive at the station, you have another form of transport, but which has to be individual. It cannot be a bus that you wait 10 minutes for and uh, not do not. It has to be something which bring you to your, your door. So to summarize, the, the GBA is potentially the largest urban labor market in the world. Uh, it's, its current and pot potential productivity depends on the extreme diversification of economic sectors that, uh, you know, that's uh, as happened in the, in the GBA. And I think that's very important. But at the same time, the ability to move uh, a different part of the GBA in less than one hour, you know, ideally, you should be able to move from any part of the GBA to an, any other part in less than one hour, and you should have a transport system. So if, if this is achieved, uh, it will have probably the, by far the highest productivity, uh, urban productivity in the world. So this is a, this is a just a plug for my book there. And then further reference, you know, about this idea, because I've gone through them a little, little fast. So this is a, thank you for, for this. Now I'm ready to answer your questions. In 2013, uh, China declared that it would adopt a market mechanism to allocate land so that it could stimulate transportation network, innovation, and to have better land use for the people. Um, obviously, the, posi uh, the, the, the policy was very positive, but it actually led to excessive land speculation in the area. And due to you know, higher property prices now, um, things are getting a little out of hand. And last year, the Chinese government actually came out to restrict you know, more land sale and property purchases. Um, so as a city planner, how would you comment on this market mechanism? And how should the city planner, if not the policymakers, amend such a policy going forward? I still think that uh... Uh, you know, economics uh, and markets, therefore, free market should drive land use. Uh, what is happening in China and in some other countries is that households do not have a way of saving or putting their saving in a in an investment which will preserve this investment in or grow in the long term. You know, they. If they put uh, in a saving account, the the interest is is ridiculous in a way, uh, and this they could invest in the stock market, but the stock market is still very volatile. It's it's not kind of a, so it it appears to me that a lot of households are investing in housing as a as a piggy bank, you know, as a as a bank account because uh, experience have shown that so far. Uh, it's the best way to preserve uh, value and to create savings. So, so I think that uh, you know to prevent uh, extra speculation, it's not so much to have uh, to have some regulation, uh, land use regulation. It's more to liberate uh, the possibility of investing outside of housing. You know, the, they and I found that in uh, in many you know countries. It of course. Uh, you have a lot of speculation also in New York or, or San Francisco, but this is due then not to the repression on on savings, but on on interest rate. But uh, the the land use, uh, you know, the, the land use is so rigid, the the regulation are so rigid that the supply do not uh, correspond. But it doesn't seem to be the case in China. In China, the, the supply has been very elastic, very responsive. Uh, now, there is another aspect, I think, in China, too, is that I think that uh, some, uh, some bank have, uh, have been a little uh, lax on uh, lending to real, for real estate. With it, you know, why is that so? Uh, it seems that they have a very soft uh, 
a constraint on uh, you know evaluating so i won't go into the detail of that but i i think that uh, uh, that's a bit uh, you know uh, what happened in real estate and uh, so also i think that some planners decided that the important thing is to to build houses but they don't consider the location you know houses is location uh, you cannot separate it so to build a, a skyscraper in the middle of nowhere is uh, is not uh, you know so some people if they consider that as a saving they will buy it but in the long run it's not a very efficient way of using resources right um over the past year or so as many investors would have seen a lot of new policy changes in china uh, with more regulations in different sectors um, i don't know if you are aware the education sector has new regimes uh, the video gaming sector, and also the real estate sector. Um, as an urban planner, I read in your book that uh, you are not necessarily a strong advocate of uh, regulation or, or, or deregulation, uh, in, so to speak, because it's not necessarily an ideological you know, doctrine to urban planning. Can you elaborate on this view and, and what you mean by deregulation not being necessarily the best? Uh, I, I believe that most uh, cities should benefit from deregulation, but the objective is not deregulation. You see what, uh, you know, they, maybe I, I was influenced by the, the Trump years, uh, 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 pres former President Trump believed that just removing a regulation in itself is a good thing. I don't believe so. I think that uh, if you look at the regulation of a city, probably 50%, of the land use regulation I'm talking, uh, are, are, are not very good. Um, we're done many years ago. And very often, if you ask what is the objective of the regulation, nobody knows, you know, or they will say something vague like, well, it protects the environment, you know. Why putting a floor ratio, say eight, protect the environment better than putting it at 10? You know, it's not true. So what I advocate is to periodically do an audit of regulations and removing the one which cannot be understood you know you don't know what is objective or the one which are have uh, uh, clearly a, a negative uh, impact so i i am really you know you, you have to check regulation periodically because regulation are a bit like dead wood on the on an old tree you know they they, they accumulate and they are there and everybody is used to to see them uh, and uh, but they should be really uh, uh, audited, you know, and, and removed. So, but the objective is not to remove regulation because there are some regulation are absolutely indispensable. You know, regulation about fire regulation or, or sanitation are absolutely necessary. So uh, they may be revised, but they are necessary. So. Well, I know that at NYU, you teach a course called Markets, Design and the City. And yes. you try to promote urban planning and urban economics, and you want to blend them together. And obviously, with regulation and and hopefully deregulation in some form, uh, you uh, you you want to see how economics and urban planning come together. I, I'm just wondering, based on your observation in the GBA, do you think urban planners and the economists work hand in hand, or the blossoming of this region is really just driven by the entrepreneurial spirit? Uh, yeah, I, I think that, uh, I think the entrepreneurial spirit is, is very strong, of course, but I, I have found, again, not necessarily in the GBA, but other part of China, in smaller cities, I have found that mayors and people who are managing the city have a better understanding of markets than the and land market than they have, I would say, even in New York, strangely enough, uh, because precisely they sell land, I mean, they sell the land use right in order to finance their city. Now, you could, you know, some people have been criticizing that maybe in the long run, it's not such a good thing, but it gives them a good understanding of the value of land. And therefore, I think uh, before you know, limiting, let's say, the use arbitrarily, the use of land, uh, I think they have a better understanding of, uh, of the market because of that and, and the real value of land. Right. 
Now, uh, over the past decade or so, uh, globalization has been such a big theme. Uh, and China, particularly the Greater Bay Area, has a lot of manufacturers you know, providing goods to the entire world. Now, due to geopolitics and the supply chain glitches over the past year or so due to COVID, um, deglobalization seems to be happening and the new trend. Um, if you observe the change of the GBA, now it's becoming more of an export oriented region in the past to now being more domestic consumption related. Um, how will this affect you know, city planning if you were to guide policymakers and give them a recommendation as to how we could better adopt if deglobalization is indeed happening? I think that uh, it's important, you know, for urban planners should not decide themselves what is good for globalization and what is good for domestic thing. That should be entrepreneur. What urban planners should do is observe very carefully uh, the way uh, enterprise diversify themselves, or even sometime uh, if there is a shock, you know, the, the pandemic was a shock. And so you, we adapt to this pandemic, but I think it would be wrong to say, oh, now we are planning for the next pandemic. I think we have the, the people who are going to adapt to the next pandemic are going to be the entrepreneur, you know, the, the household and the entrepreneur. And the job of the planner is to monitor very, very carefully what is happening, you know, where, uh, you know, for instance, it could be that some area which were industrial become obsolete. It, the way it happened in Hong Kong, you know, Hong Kong was a big industrial base before uh, China, you know, uh, became industrial itself. So, and in Hong Kong, you adapted, I think, relatively quickly. You didn't try to keep your industrial area forever to maintain blue collar job, but, and you, you shifted from manufacturing to, to services and your infrastructure followed. And I think this is the, what should be done. You know, the planner should not say, hey, uh, because of deglobalization, we are going to do this. Uh, they should observe what the entrepreneurs are doing and adapt their infrastructure and their land use to, uh, to support what the entrepreneurs are doing. Is there a particular city or area that we can learn from in other countries? I think there is nothing comparable. Uh, they, you, you are tracing a new, you know, it's... The, the GB8 is so different, you know, in size, you know, again, an order of magnitude larger. I mean, well, you could say Tokyo is 35 million, maybe, you know, depending Tokyo, Yokohama. But uh, uh, I think that you, you can learn from micro things, you know, let's say maybe, maybe there is a city which has a, a, a good, uh, you know, refuse disposal system or or new technology on sewers, you know, which emerge in one city. But as a planning, you know, general planning idea, I don't think, I think you are, you are tracing the new road, you know, you are, you know, uh, in the same way as say, when London developed during the industrial revolution, there was no models. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the London took a long time to realize that the uh, sewers were important and the safe water supply was important. Uh, you know, for large cities, but there was no precedent, and I think that uh, you are you are tracing the way here in the in the Bay, including, by the way, for the other cluster cities in China, which are planned in China. Uh, I mean, Shanghai probably uh, is getting closer to you in terms of size, but the other, you know, cluster, the cluster around Chengdu or thinking. Uh, are still emerging. I mean, they are, they are in a smaller stage. So you, you are really the pioneers there. You mentioned earlier that mobility is key to the development of a region. Uh, obviously, when mobility increases, uh, productivity may increase, but at the same time, there could be a lot of drawbacks. For example, uh, air pollution, noise pollution, friction between people. Uh, nowadays, when we all think about ESG, how do policymakers and city planners balance between the pros and cons of mobility? And what would you give a recommendation to policymakers? Well, uh, again, mobility has to be adapted to densities. 
that means when the land is very expensive, uh, the mobility probably should take place underground. And uh, again, there are now technology to, to dig, which are much, much cheaper than they were before. Uh, and I think that's more and more. Then you have uh, electricity, you know, uh, uh, replacing diesel and, and gasoline. I think that will contribute a lot. But uh, mobility should be the objective. The constraint is the environment. You know, you cannot put the environment as objective because if the environment is objective, then, uh, you know, unemployment is a perfect way to, to uh, you know, to solve the environmental problem. Uh, so that's not a possibility. So the objective is still growth, you know, and economic uh, innovation, but the, there is a very heavy constraint. You have to pay a price, you know, it's a tax, let's say, for to solve environmental problem. It's a big mistake, of course, to ignore environmental. Uh, you know, again, I, I go back to the example of London during the Industrial Revolution. You know, they suddenly in London, there was a higher mortality in London than they were in the countryside because of pollution, because of uh, bad quality of water. So, uh, the, so you have to solve this problem as you go. And, uh, but I don't think that, uh, you know, there are some people, I, 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 a lot in the United States and in Europe, who think that everybody should bicycle, you know, that will be the, the, the way. This is not possible. Again, it contradicts the idea of labor market. If everybody bicycle, then you, you are going to be restricted to a job within, you know, 10, 20 minutes bicycle from your home. That's not maybe why, why you move to, to Shenzhen or Hong Kong in the first place, you know, then you, so I think that you, you have to, uh, you have to bite the bullet, you know, and say, we need to have a faster transport. We need to have, uh, more easy transport to use and to connect and and we have to solve the problem of pollution and thanks god with uh, now is electric you know many electric cars going on and even bus uh, that will uh, that that will probably solve a, a large part of of the pollution you know that, uh, but again uh, i think that we should consider more and more uh, going underground especially if you look at the price of land, you know, if you build skyscraper, which are more than 300 meter high, it means that the land is expensive. Then it makes sense also to dig underground and to have uh, your, your main means of transport underground. And with, of course, uh, very good ventilation and, and safety again. And final question for you. Uh, you know, obviously we, uh, we, we see a lot of great opportunities in the GBA. Uh, but what kind of challenges as a city planner do you foresee that will emerge over the next few years? And if they do emerge, do you have any advice as to how to resolve and to prevent that from happening? I, I you know, I mentioned transport, but uh, housing, uh, housing, I think is a major thing, you know, to, to maintain uh, your activities, you, you need top engineers, you need uh, a lot of uh, very smart people, but you need a lot of workers too. You know, during the pandemic, we call them indispensable workers. You know, the, the workers were putting things on the shelf or, or packaging for people to deliver. So, so you need all sorts of people to, for your economy to work. And very often when a city is very successful, uh, there's a tendency to forget a bit the affordability of people of that, either because regulation increases the price of housing too much, or uh, maybe lack of transport in area, which you know could be are cheaper and could be accessible. So I think housing is it will be housing for all the people who want to work in the bay will be a, a probably a major constraint, and I don't have a solution for that, frankly. I mean. Each each city is different. You have different system. Uh, you have, will have to. I think that the system will work the best. Other one will uh, rely on markets. That means to have very different standard. You know, and uh, uh, and again, a, a large supply of housing. You know, that that's not constrain the supply for uh, 
by regulations, you know, that, uh, but again, I don't have a, a solution for that, but I think it will be the major constraint in the future. Well, thank you so much for your time tonight, uh, Professor. And thank you so much all for joining for this event. And if you have any questions that you would like uh, the professor to answer, feel free to send me emails or uh, chat later and I could post your questions to the professor. And I do welcome professor if you ever, uh, when the city opens up again, I do want to invite you to Hong Kong and a, a visit in the GBA. So thank you so much for the time tonight. Thank you so much for your invitation. I may very well take it as soon as it is possible.